and welcome to some of the supplementary content for the Ravnica Allegiance pre-pre-release. I'm Kathleen from Loading Ready Rep. And I'm joined by Cameron. And we have two of our special guests here. We have Gavin Verhey from uh, Magic the uh, Gathering. You're a senior designer? Yeah, that means I'm old, unfortunately. <laughs> That's what senior stands for. My full title is a Senior Game Designer and Product Architect. But mostly what that means is I just make up what the cards do and what our products are, which is awesome. I can play Magic all day and then make cards. So not too shabby. That sounds rad. I'm also joined by Shivam Bhatt who is the co-host of the Commander and Podcast. Hello, everybody. I'm not quite as awesome as Gavin, but I also get to play Magic once in a while and uh, pretend to make cards. It's <laughs> almost as good. And I have to say, Shivam, your enthusiasm is like just the level above anyone I've ever met. It's amazing. I love <laughs> it. You love this game, and that's what, as someone who works on the game, I love to see. Like, I love hanging out with you <laughs> because you just love what we create, and as a creator, that means so much. Well... It's a game, and if we're not here to have fun, and if everybody's not having fun, then what are we doing, right? Like, I feel that if we're sitting down at a table of magic and your friend does something really amazing, that's as awesome as if you did it yourself, even if you were the recipient of getting uh, crushed in the face. <laughs> but sometimes it's just really cool to watch the deck do the thing they do. And speaking of getting crushed in the face, hey! Yeah. Let's talk about our game. Yeah, <laughs> we're here to uh, just recap what our decks were, what we built at the pre-release, and uh, uh, what we thought some of our sickest plays were, because as Magic players, we all have sick play stories. <laughs> or at least, my opponent had a sick play, and it was some bad beats for me. Uh, speaking of... Oh, let me talk about sick, bad beats. <laughs> yeah, let's even kick it off. Well... I picked Simic to start with because I was really interested in playing with the adapt mechanic. I really like moving dice around. My deck was called Pass the Dice, Please. Um, and it was really cool. I loved the way these cards all synergized with each other. I loved how we were able to move dice around. And over the course of the games I got to play, I got to discover some neat tricks that I'm sure that the R&D had intended. But the first time you pull something off, like, for instance, um, so there's the Simic Guild Mage, which is called the Combine Guild Mage. And the Combine Guild Mage has two powers, which say uh, all the creatures you have in uh, that come into play this turn get a plus one, plus one. Or you can move a plus one, plus one counter from one creature to another. The other card is Aeromunculus, which is like my all-star Simic creature, which is a 2-3 flyer that lets you adapt for one. And what adapt says is that um, you can only adapt if there are no plus one, plus one counters on it. So you can use a Combine Guild Mage to save your plus one, plus one counter, and then adapt Aeromunculus again, and get another one. So you can keep kind of growing your uh, guild mage, or moving these counters around, and adapting the Aeromunculus over and over again. And if you have my pet favorite card, and probably like the best semi card there is, the Biomancer's uh, Apprentice, familiar? I forget what it was called. Biomancer Buddy. Uh, this card is insane, because it says activated abilities cost two less. That means all activated abilities. Adapt is an activated ability, your guild mage's powers are activated ability. So all these things end up being super cheap. And then it's got that secret second card, I mean second ability, which says, when you tap this, the next time you adapt this turn, you can adapt as if there were no plus one, plus one counters on it. So you're getting a discount, and then you're going to get more dice on your dude. And then you can move the dice around, and you just... You get to twiddle a lot of knobs. It is wonderful. It is all I want to do in Magic, is either make a ton of tokens or put a crap ton of dice on the table. And watching your game, I mean, I was table friending um, one of Shivan's matches, and it almost felt like a commander game, which is so appropriate oh, yes, for you, right? That's but exactly you what it was. You build out this big wide board, you're putting all your counters on your creatures, you're assembling your little combos. I thought that was delightful. It was a sheer joy to play. Like, in my game against Graham, we ended up going so long that I had a card out uh, called... Guardian's, uh, what is Guardian it? Project. Yeah, Guardian Project, which is an enchantment, which says if I play a creature that shares no name with any creature in my graveyard or in play, I get to draw a card. Now in Limited, you're almost never going to have more than one or two of a type of creature. And in Commander, you're never going to have more than one creature. So this just means play a creature, draw a card. And with my Simic deck, I was just play a creature, draw a card. And it got down to I had three cards left by the end of the game before Graham finished me off. And after the game, I looked at those three cards and there were a draw four, a draw four, and an island, <laughs> which would have not, not won me that game. No, no, it's tricky. But man, Simic goes long and does all the silly things. And if you're like a Johnny, like I am, this just feels good. It feels real good. Even if you're losing, you feel real good. Because you do all this crazy stuff. Oh my God. I mean, doing things is important in oh, magic. Oh, I love it. 
Like, you can lose, like, in the first, uh, the Guilds of Ravnica pre-pre-release, I did not, uh, I lost pretty badly in one game with Demir, but I was surveilling a lot, and I was like, I, whatever, <sighs> I still feel great. I'm doing the thing, right? Oh, yeah. It's, it's good value for doing the thing, I think. And when my deck won, it won spectacularly. Mm. And it's just like, here's big, beefy man with 12 counters on it, just... I mean, I don't know, I like turning things sideways. I like moving dice around. It was everything I wanted out of a deck. I was fully in love with it by the end of it. What was the sickest play you made? You know, the thing is, though, I don't think I had any, like, insane tech. There were a lot of really sneaky plays I made, but not Ooh, really, like... What? Like, so there's an, um, an instant in this spell called, I think, Stony Strength or something to that effect, which says, one green, put a plus one, plus one counter on a card, untap that creature. So I would do things like, I'm going to attack you, Graham. And Graham would be like, well, I'm going to just take that because I've got this amazing ability to crack back, hit you, and you're going to die or something. And then I'd be like, ah, put a 1-1 one -one counter on this so he's bigger, and untap him. Secret block smash. It's wonderful. And what I realized with this card is that if somebody else is trying to adapt, and they're about to put, let's say, six counters on their creature, I'm just going to put one on. Your adapt fizzles. You've wasted six mana or whatever it is trying to adapt your creature, and I'm not going to get smashed for a whole lot next turn. Now, you can't only target creatures you control. So that's Whoops. It. That was probably something I should have paid attention to. Yeah, you know, it's fine. We all learn. We did this in the supplemental games after the tournament when we were trying to jam our decks again. It was really neat. Mm. Look, it was late at night. We were all very tired. <laughs> <laughs> and now we've laid an important lesson down for everyone to know. But, don't try and cast Stony Strength yeah, on your Don't cast creatures. it on their creatures, but cast it on yours because it really works better than it looks. Mm. Oh, yeah. How about you, Gavin? Did you have fun? I, of course, I got to play Magic, so <laughs> check, check that box, which mm -hmm. is awesome. So I chose Azorius. I'm a blue-white mage. I've always loved that color combination. And my pool was kind of tricky because I, I opened it up, and sometimes you open these guild pre-release kits, and you just have everything you could ever want, right? You just go straight down your lane, blue and white. And I kind of had, like, so a great Jund deck mm -hmm. in with my blue-white deck, and so I had half of, like, a number of different decks that were kind of coming Oof. together. So I scraped together and eventually decided to go blue, white, black. And um, even though my deck wasn't super duper strong, I had a great time playing. And really the match that I enjoyed the most by far, um, I mean, they're, they're both great, but against Marshall, we played oh. blue, white on blue, white, super long game, great positioning back and forth. Like I knew I had counter spells in my deck. He knew he had counter spells in his deck. We had to very carefully jockey around when to cast our spells, save our removal spells for what matter, kind of like, positioning there's this thing in magic i talk about sometimes which is like tactics mm -hmm. where it's instead of just knowing what's in your hand or what's in your opponent's hand knowing your deck has this thing and my deck has this thing and if we play out this whole game i'm going to lose the, the thing x so i have to save this card to deal with with y card right and so like i knew um marshall had this gate colossus in his deck this 8-8 eight, eight artifact oh. i will talk about the gate colossus as yeah. well Oof. Yeah, that card, that card's beating, by the way. Super mm -hmm. strong. And so it's like, okay, I know I can't beat this card going late, so I have to, like, save my artifact removal spell for this card or save my pacifism for this card exactly. Mm -hmm. And so that's the kind of, like, super deep in-your-head play that I think a lot of Azorius players really enjoy, and, and Demir <laughs> players, too, for that matter. And it, it's things that you'll never actually see just watching a game of Magic. Like, yeah, on turn 12, maybe I'll eventually pass this in the Gate Colossus as a player. You're like, oh, okay, sweet, that happened. But, like... It was in my opening hand, and I was like, okay, I'm going to set up for that. So 12 turns from now, <laughs> I make the perfect play. And uh, that's really satisfying. Mm -hmm. As far as like my favorite thing about my deck, um, I had Dovin's Acuity, which is a super fun card. It's I, so good. I love it. Um, he sure is. Yeah, he's, he's so cute. <laughs> the, what, what a great looking Videl. Good old information campaign. Yeah, disinformation campaign was one of my favorite cards to play in Guilds of Ravnica. I'm sure, Kathleen, you've had a lot of fun with that too as a fellow Demir Magus. So fun. Yeah. <laughs> And I mean, it's not fun to be on the receiving end. No, it? sir. Hey, don't, don't worry about that. The thing I love about disinformation <laughs> campaign is to make sure that your opponent's going to lose and it's going to take a long time to do so. You're like, yeah, I'm just going to slowly draw some cards <laughs> and we're going to sit here for a while and you might have a chance to get back into the game, but you don't. And with Dovin's Acuity, it felt kind of similar. Like, oh, I'm just going to gain a little bit of life and draw some cards and then cast this main phase draw spell and pick this back up to my hand. Oh, and, and life is glorious. I do like that, I, and I'm sure this was very intentional, that the design is very, like, the, the cards mirror one each other, mirror each other, and they do the essentially a very similar thing, but they do it in the ways that those guilds do it, right? It's about, you know, <coughs> drawing, like, for 
Yeah, I just think it's really like very reflective of the flavor. And uh, yeah, it feels like Acuity even has like kind of addendum attached to it because it says play an instant on your main phase to bounce right. it back to your hand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, specifically like, an instant. Right. What impressed me about Azorius was how tanky it felt. Mm. Right, like you, you were playing a control match, but it felt very different from the way that Demir plays a control match, where they want to control the board and control the flow of the game. Whereas the Azorius deck felt like it could take a hit and recover from it, and it had a lot more depth and robustness So much incidental life gain, too. Mm -hmm. Right, you're looping at acuity, you're gaining two life every time, you've got the four mana draw two that gains you two life. And mm -hmm. yeah, I absolutely agree, Cam, that, you know, you've got... You can kind of you can you can play the Namir game a little bit of like gumming up the ground and playing some flyers, but you can also just go on the aggressive sometimes, like remove their creatures, bounce their creatures. You've got the three one Caracal like an attack through a um, couple ground guys, so it was great. I, I had a great time. Mm -hmm. uh, what was the greatest thing you did aside from pacifying Marshall? Oh yeah, eight eight. <laughs> <laughs> then setting up a play twelve turns later is like my favorite thing in Magic. But I, really, there's a game against Adam, uh, my second to last game, where uh, the one I ended up winning, which is why I maybe like this play so much, where I got Dome's Acuity really rolling. Like I played it on turn three or four, and then I picked it back up maybe three times over the course of the game, Ugh. and just, it feels so good, right? And that's just when Azorius is rolling. Um, from a game design standpoint, what's always really cool is when we can line up what the guild wants to do with like the cards you want to play, right? Mm -hmm. And the fact that Dome's Acuity, as you were saying, she even fits so well into what Addendum is doing. Like, hey, play instance during mm -hmm. your main phase. You get this thing back. It's such a good feeling, and I felt great doing it. I like it when the th when it's like, here's the thing you need to do. How about we reward you for doing the thing? Right. Absolutely. You know, looking back at. Zendikar, uh, not to take it away from Ravnica for a second, but that had landfall. You know mm -hmm. what's awesome about landfall? You just you want to play lands every turn anyway. Mm -hmm. And with uh, with stuff like this, it's like, what do you want to do? And since on your main phase, you get your addendum effects. How about a little bonus for doing that? So it's perfect. Well, and, and like the thing is, especially sorry for cutting you off, Shivan. A lot of the things that blue white control wants to do is draw cards. Yeah. And like a lot of the instants that you're playing in blue white control are drawing cards. So it's like I get to draw. So many cards! Well, it goes back to that, you know what's great? Making the game take a long time. Like, I, I, I partially chose Azorius, because I was like, you know what, look, I'm at the pre-pre-release, I gotta get as much camera time as possible. <laughs> so, so uh, you know, I'm just gonna build up my 1-4 flyers, my 1-3 oh, flyers, and then, yeah, like, I'm, I might lose, but like, look, all I'm saying, I had one of the two of the longest matches of the day. So, yeah, uh, but I had the who, other was, one, right? who was the real winner here? <laughs> now, the thing I wanted to say, though, about Azorius especially, is that having that thing where you play your instance on your turn to get the addendum adds this extra layer of just depth to it because normally as a control player you're like well it's your turn i'm going to leave my mana open counter whatever you do if not i'm going to draw my three cards it's wonderful but you can be like oh well what if i do it on my turn then i can scry three as well and then it's like what's the choice i make suddenly there's this layer of strategy that control kind of had before but now it's like playing it on your main phase is a real trade-off and it feels really good if it works right especially with rewards like acuity what control players really like is options mm. it's really cool to just have options and with instance the option is always well i'm just going to pass and then cast it at the end of your turn which is, feels great nothing wrong with that but it's cool to have that extra layer of option and with a card like precognitive perception which was my pre-release card absolutely fantastic i'm happy to just cast a jace's ingenuity at the end of my opponent's turn and draw three cards but man, main phasing it and scrying yes. three feels so good. So when you have that opening, when you have that moment, it's a cool thing to be able to fire off. So mm -hmm. I was really happy with Azorius, and uh, Addendum was great. Yeah. Also, as as somebody who plays uh, against you know control, sometimes I like the idea of like you know not sitting there and the constant line being Drago, yeah. right as they're waiting. Like it makes the game like you know a little bit more stuff mm -hmm. might happen on on the main phase, right? So yeah, and that's. That's kind of the game Azorius is happy to play. Like, if you're draw going, playing instance on your main phase, eh, you're in a pretty good spot. I can dig that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, like, also it means that, like, maybe if they're playing instance on their main phase, they're not leaving a bunch of mana right. open mm. to maybe, like, it makes it a little bit more interactive if you're not playing a Azorius. Like, maybe you're like, well, they have, like, a bunch of open mana, so what's going to happen here? Right, right. It gives you the illusion that you can cast your spells before I destroy them. <laughs> yeah. Right? That's, that's important. Yes. Here's a secret Simic tech. Simic has a card called Wilderness Reclamation, which untaps all your lands at the end of your turn. Which means you can do things like play an addendum card on your turn, and then untap all your lands, and then draw three cards on their turn, too. Because mm. it's blue and green. Mm. 
Yeah, it's it is real dirty. Mm -hmm. Real dirty. Yeah, one thing we try and do, sorry, Kathleen, it's really fast. One thing we try and do in the design that's really cool is we try and build in combos with the neighboring guilds. So, like, mm -hmm. if you were playing blue white, a natural color to branch into would be green because it's easy to splash. And then this is a great card to splash in your blue white deck because you're going to addend them on your turn and then untap all your lands it's on your gross. opponent's turn. It's gross. Mm -hmm. Or there's all the cards in blue white that pump up your flyers that give plus one, plus zero, oh, or plus zero, plus one. That works great with Afterlife, because if you build blue, white, black, you get all these flying tokens that are even better when they're 2-1 flyers. So there's all kinds of little combos like that. It built feels in really good side. when you find it. That's exactly what I was going to talk about, actually. I was going to talk about because I was playing, uh, I opened a Rakdos pack. Mm -hmm. uh, not because I like did a lot of research before the set came out. I was just like, why not? How Rakdos of you. Appropriate. Yeah, just like, <laughs> YOLO, let's Flip play it. Line, legit. Yeah. Um, and uh, I found that there was a lot of like nice synergies branching into Orzhov and stuff like that as well. Not necessarily for like the, you know, like some of like the, the sort of more controly stuff, but like uh, the black creatures that gave you afterlife tokens, uh, because you can use those to sort of like plow in, guarantee damage. A flyer is a much more like good evasive way to chip in. And then when you do have to like sacrifice things to like enable your spectacle, because there are creatures that you can sacrifice to, having a a, a, a token that you essentially didn't pay anything for because it already came with a, like a fairly somewhat relevant body. For example, the Orzhov Enforcer that's up on screen is like just a beautiful example of this. Like it's going to block, it's going to get something off the board because it's got death touch. You get a spirit that you can then, you know, throw away to something else, sacrifice to another creature because there's some aristocrat sub-theming going on. Like, there's actually just an aristocrat. It's like vindictive vampire or vengeful vampire or something like that. Like, there's, you know, rewards for throwing things away that work mm. in both the red and the black deck. It wasn't in my deck, but Aaron had a black-red 2-2 two -two that said at the, it came <sighs> in with haste and at the beginning of your turn, you could, or at the beginning of your upkeep, mm -hmm. you could sacrifice a creature to uh, do two damage. Like, all of that, like, that's a Rakdos card, but it works great with Afterlife. Right. And I like those, like, little <laughs> synergies between, so people don't feel totally hemmed into always building that the same kind of deck. My life. Yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. I mean, it's great to be able to peck into trigger your spectacle and sacrifice. And mm -hmm. plus, Rakdos just wants resiliency, too, right? Mm -hmm. When your opponent's killing off your creatures, when you're trading off in combat, that's not great for Rakdos. Getting that flyer uh, as a little bonus is really nice to make sure you can peck through. Mm -hmm. yeah. You're saying, Kip? Oh, I'm building this in standard. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Aristocrats? Yeah. Oh, God. This I is Fireblade Artist. List. Well, I mean, like, the, the hero me. of 10th uh, District. Oh, is, God. Is that what so it's called, good. Hero of the 10th yep. District? Yes. Whenever you cast a uh, multicolor spell, it, uh, you get a 1 1 hero. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that guy goes straight into the wood chipper. Oh, my God. Right? Like, you chuck it to the Fireblade Artist, and that's how I lost both of my games to Aaron. <laughs> I'm just saying. Like, the, humans the, being chucked into the chipper. Yeah, and then there's just like the, the Vindictive Vampire at four, which is you know, it's, it's a little expensive for a Blood Artist, but it, I'll take it. I'll absolutely take it. And you've got Judith, you've got uh, Alenda from Ixlon. Oh, it's going to be great in standard. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I mean, what, I don't know if it's going to be good, it's but it's going to be. I don't know if it's good, but it will be great. Yes, yes exactly. <laughs> You know, one thing you see in this set, too, is those Multicolor Matters cards. Like, mm -hmm. we didn't really see a lot of those in Guilds of Ravnica, yeah. mm -hmm. but now that we have all ten Guilds to pull from, all the mana fixing of the, of the lands, you can kind of build that three, four, five color deck pretty easily. Mm -hmm. So you've got cards like the Hero of the Tenth District, you've got cards like the five mana artifact that taps for mana, and when you play a multicolored spell, you draw a uh, card. The Tomb of the Guild the Pact. Tomb, Tomb of the, the Guild Pact, yeah. right? So there's a fun little even five color deck you could try brewing up there if you wanted also, to. Also, the art on this card is... One of my favorites. I, I leave that, that as exercise to the viewer to uh, brew with this. Interesting. Yeah. Speaking of Judith, I actually had Judith in my pre-release pool, and oh. she was great. Yeah. She was not ridiculous. Like, she's not super overpowered, but, like, uh, you know, but, like, if creatures are going to be dying anyhow, you're, like, your creatures are automatically better, which is good, because Rakdos is sort of a low-to-the-ground like smaller butt creatures smaller and so judith just gets is gonna like turn a lot of like trades to like trade ups which is good and then every time a non-token creature you control dies you uh you get to ping one damage so what you can do is you like basically your two two is now a three three that can trade with a three four because that one damage is going to go in the stack or if there's something that's really grinding like your gears you're playing some azorius uh a uh, person who's got just like that 2 5 that can't be, that is with vigilance that can't be blocked, and it's like, this is going to kill me. I can't attack into it. I can't do anything. It's like, well, I can just, I can suicide in. I can sack, I can sack a dude to this 
get an effect, and then do the extra damage if you have Judith on. So you can sort of like incrementally make a mm -hmm. lot of little effects, make something big, which is like I think important. And, and also options. And also peck through for that final few points of damage, right? That's like if true. they're at five and you've got a board, just attack with flunge, attack with it all. Yeah, you know, you'll be safe. Yeah, mm -hmm. math is for blockers. I don't care. <laughs> math is for blockers. I'll, I'll deal damage to you one way or the other. Right. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. the show will go on. ABJ. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> ABJ always be jamming, Cameron. ABJ. I like it. Yeah. I like it. Uh. Oh, right. I do have to talk about the sickest play I made. Mm -hmm. uh, this is another Rakdos card. It's another uncommon. A lot of very good uncommons in this set. Uh, uh, it's called Cry of the Carnarium. Yeah. Cry of the Carnarium is an interesting card because it's oh, uh, a sorcery for, uh, for three. So it's very cheap. But all creatures get minus two, minus two until end of turn. And exile all creature cards that were put there from the battlefield this turn. So in Rakdos, you're going to be killing a lot of your own things. Which is fine if you have Judith, because then that's still damage that you can start dealing to things. But very importantly, and especially against you, like mm -hmm. if Judith can live through this. Well, I mean, I, I, this exiles it instead, so there's no death triggers on it. Oh, right. Mm -hmm. Right. But uh, very importantly against you. Yeah, this in our match one, I yeah. think, uh, this killed two afterlife creatures. Yeah. Only didn't kill them, it exiled them, so... So no triggers, oh no. Yeah, yeah, yeah so you don't get your like, spirits. It was the most brutal of blowouts. Oh yeah. no. I, I felt like I had finally stabilized in that match, and it was just... Mm, nah. Yeah. And nah. How think, about nah? I think the, <laughs> the use case for this is like... I mean, I ended up with like a, a 2-3 left over after it, which is great if you mm -hmm. can, like, if your creatures can live through it. But even if they don't, like, wiping the board and being in a position, like... You know, or also you can play the second main. So maybe you do some crummy attacks that seem bad. You get those triggers because things are dying, and then you know after that's all, and there's damage marked on creatures from the end of the turn, like bigger creatures that you couldn't otherwise deal with. That you just finish them off, hmm. which is I think a very useful way of doing it because it's a sorcery. So you can't like surprise bonus. Everything also gets minus two, minus two, right? You have to sort of like well, you can't yeah. just like snap it off. And I think this card plays well into the, the, the Rakdos mind game of not knowing when you can block, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Believing that you always have to be blocking, Ugh. because if you allow a Rakdos player to start generating um, or consistently being able to activate Spectacle, the game can get away from you very quickly. Like, there's that, it's a 5-drop, 3-2, but if you have Spectacle, it's 3 mana, and it draws a card. Mm -hmm. That's a problem, right? Like, I, it's... Yeah, it's crummy, with, or not it's crummy, it's, it's maybe not what you want to be without Spectacle, but it's like, oh god, when can I block? Do I have to block? Mm -hmm. Do I have to block this 1-1? One, one? And then possibly it's going to trade up, and mm -hmm. then I don't get anything? Oh no. Like, yeah, yeah, and even if you, you feel like you have profitable blocks, you have to keep cards like this in mind. Mm -hmm. A Rakdo show always keeps you on edge. Yes. Mm -hmm, there you go. It's you always know, surprising. Right, indeed. <laughs> one thing you definitely see in this set is there's a lot more exile than normal. Yes. And, and that is big because of afterlife. We wanted to make sure there were answers to it, so, because afterlife mm. can really get out of hand sometimes, You're, mm -hmm. as you'll talk about in a second, Cameron, I'm sure. You can gum up the ground and then have all these flyers, so keep an eye out for that exile text. In a lot of sets, it's just a bonus little rider. You see that on a card, you're mm -hmm. like, whatever, that might not ever matter. Here, it is extraordinarily relevant uh, to make sure that not only can you deal with afterlife, but also there's a lot of recursion, ways to bring things back from the graveyard. So keep an and eye then, out for those. Yeah, the vindictive vampire in Judith's uh, death clauses. Mm -hmm. Right, right, absolutely. Oh. And like the, the Tasha's death clause. Ta Tasha's death clause. The common black removal spell. There's to be exile a creature with power three or less. Right, the, that exile's a big deal. Scourge mark. Uh, the Rakdos removal spell that deals two and exiles the creature mm -hmm. uh, for one R. Both super important cards to help keep those spirits in check. Yeah, Scourge mark was very useful in this game. Just be like, oh no, right. Because yeah, you've got a lot of value. Speaking of value, Cam, mm -hmm. tell us about your Orzhov deck. Well, uh, Gavin talked a bit about strategy and the way that strategy plays into, into the game on the table. And I felt that my big strategic win was opening Seraph of the Scales. Ah, <laughs> and yes. sleeving it up that and then so drawing good. it in several games. W would you say that card is balanced? Oh, scales. Oh, 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 yeah. Oh, oh, yeah, she's a Libra. Um, mm -hmm. it's, yeah, oh, it's good. Also, the Megali Villeneuve's art is oh, always yeah. spectacular. Here, it's it's gorgeous. And she was my promo foil, and all I want to do nice. is just, like... Shiny shine. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> three toughness is a bit lower than I would like on... But it's she's four mana. She comes down on four, and... 
has Afterlife 2 and uh, just the graveyard recursion that was accessible in, in Orzhov was really strong. Um, the, come on brain, Dead Revels, getting two back, drawing divination, I'll take it. Mm. Um, mm. But as for sick plays, I'm not sure I had them. You know, occasionally <laughs> top deck Mortify, that feels pretty good, but it's hardly a sick play. It's more of a foul rip. Um, <laughs> but Orzhov felt like it played into one of my preferred tactics, strategies, operational level uh, game plans, which is the attrition strategy, mm. right? You have a lot of high power, low toughness creatures. You have a lot of death touch creatures. Mm -hmm. You can profitably trade quite frequently with your opponents because then you start generating spirits. Mm. And I felt that angelic exaltation also really paid into, played into the strategy. Oh, yeah. I wasn't sure what to expect of it, but you know, going from previous pre-releases, going from sealed environments, you can wind up with these large board jams. And having access to a large number of evasive creatures felt, I, I felt that, you know, being able to jam in, turn one creature sideways was a reasonably small opportunity cost to be able to crack in for eight. Yeah. I'm on board with that. Yeah. And it felt like there's a lot of death touch on the ground in this game mm -hmm. and in the set. Like, I know that I kept running into when I was playing against Graham, who was also on Orzov, that it felt like there were, every time I would try to attack, there were like two or three little just things that had either incidental death touch or activatable death touch. Well, th yeah. there is also a death touch uh, combat trick as well. Oh, blades, like, something blades? Blade brand? Blade, blade oh, brand, I think. I didn't know but yeah, that. Noxious Grudian is at common. Oh, it's, a, it's, it's a gray ogre it with death. It is noxious. And obnoxious. And, and uh, then uh, there's Orsoth a Enforcer. Twilight Panther as well, the one mana, one two, that you can pay B to give a death yeah. touch at the end of turn. So there's some ways out there to, to stop those big creatures. And you see that open guild gate on the other side, it makes you very, very uncomfortable. But, but that's really important, right? Because none of us here are repping it, but Gruul is running around these parts. And those yeah. are some big, and Simic, I guess, yeah. too, right? And those are some big old creatures you gotta <laughs> be able to deal with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's just Yeah, funny. like there's, is it an uncommon ogre in Gruul for five mana that's a 6-5? Yeah. Oh, I yeah. think that yeah. might I think be that's common. common. Yeah, common, yeah. Well, with downside the, is it has to attack every Downside. Time. It's yeah. like, ah, shucks, that's, attacking yeah. again. That's exactly what Rack... Like, like, lead they, with your fist. They, they just want to turn the man sideways as fast as possible. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we like to add words on the cards to make sure no one makes any mistakes with them. That's right. one where it's like, yeah, you want to attack with this. Just trust me. Let's attack with the 6-5. Mm -hmm. It's going to be good. It's going to be good. Um, but yeah, I mean, your deck was called La Our Lady of the Profitable Trade, right? And yep. watching your games, I would say you were able to do just that. Yeah, well, it, it, it felt really good when I was able to, like... I felt like I was doing the thing, mm. right? Even if the thing was a fairly straightforward, make make good combats, uh, you know, it, it, was, it was straightforward, but it works. It works. It pays off. Um, and it looked really fun. Actually. Yeah, generating incremental advantage is, is uh, a, an interesting way to pay off. Also, I, I opened Kaya and didn't play her at all. I don't. I mean, the the, the through line in my deck tech video was. Uh, so, what would you say you do around here, Kaya? I think <laughs> Kaya is not maybe as much for limited as she is for other formats. No, but I mean, I wanted to see what she did, and it turns out she sat in my library, so. Which Fair. I can relate to. I also like <laughs> sitting in libraries. <laughs> well, well, and she's, you know, she can go ghosty. She's just hanging out. Like, you can't really see her. Yeah, uh, I imagine that at some point, maybe I would have been able to blow away a token with her and felt, like, very smart. I don't know. If you're playing against Rakdos and you actually just, like, start blowing away, like, like their one little ones. dudes, their enablers that they're hoping to mm -hmm. plow into, that's actually kind of problematic for them. It's not like... Like, but not every card in every set is for everything. No. It's fine. Well, I think it's also, like, in Limited, you slam this down, it doesn't look like much, but if your opponent's going to attack it, it'll soak some life out of the game. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you're just going to gain two life every turn, which is a very, like, meaningful advantage. Yeah. And mm -hmm. then you can pick off an important spirit or a larger token. There's a few big green tokens oh, in this true, set. Oh, that's actually. To watch out. So even, like, the 4-4 four, four Gruul tokens, for example, have a converted mana cost of zero. So you can exile those mm -hmm. right away. And then you, you, you have to worry about the ultimate, too. You're exiling a bunch of cards from their graveyard, and they don't deal with it, 
you just off them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And especially yeah. in a creature heavy format, especially with like mm. guilds like Gruul, guilds like uh, uh, Rakdos, and I think probably to a lesser extent Simic, that probably want to run a lot of creatures. Yeah. You start exiling anything from their graveyard, you're hitting creatures. Mm -hmm. And it shuts off the recursion, once again, right? You have cards like uh, Dead Revelers, is that it? The spectacle return two cards from your graveyard to your yes. hand? Yes, uh, mm -hmm. Dead Revelers, right? yes. And yeah. just being able to make it like, like nope, no revelry for you. We are we are cutting off the good cards in your graveyard can mm -hmm. make a really big difference. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yep. Well, so I guess in conclusion, this set is great, and please go check it out at your own pre-release. Yeah, coming up very soon. Ton of fun. And I hope y'all enjoy it. We spent a lot of time making it, so go out, play Ravnica Allegiance. It's a blast. Bye, everybody. <laughs>